What is up everybody? Welcome back to the Geek Pantheon. I am Eric and today I want to do a follow-up video that I did a couple weeks ago where I talked about the 10 biggest mistakes I had made as a dungeon master by today discussing the five worst player habits that I have had in the past. I am only doing five because I don't get to play that often. It's not that I'm that much better of a player than I am a DM, uh, but I just wanted to go through these and kind of talk about what caused me to develop these habits and also ways to step out of it and try to prevent yourself and how I prevent myself from doing some of these things. So hopefully this will be helpful to you all, or if you're a DM, you can show this to your players and uh, just have a good time at the table. So let's get into it. The first one is adjacent to a really common player problem at a table, which is offering unsolicited advice and telling other people how to use their turn, how to play their character, things like that. Don't do that, never do that. That's not an okay thing to do. But what I wanna specifically talk about is feeling ignored when your advice isn't taken. And this can manifest in a couple of different ways, whether it is uh, somebody has solicited the table for advice, like, oh, I don't know what I need to do, or the party is having a group discussion about the best course of action to take in the session, adventure, campaign, what have you. And it's really easy to give your insight, feel like you you really have a good idea as to what needs to happen in any of those circumstances. And then when the advice isn't taken, feel ignored, feel a little bit dejected, like your opinion isn't valued at the table. It's a really natural thing to come up against. And part of it is born out of, and a lot of these are born out of, this idea that our character is the protagonist of the story. And it's it's super understandable to apply that filter onto your own character because you are seeing the story through their eyes. You are pushing them to drive the story. And so it's easy to get caught up in that line of thinking, of thinking, well, I, like, I'm the protagonist. Even if it's not a conscious thing that you're thinking, but just that unconscious, like, that it's a completely understandable thing to do, but you have to shift into thinking of the party as the protagonist and there being a group of protagonists driving the story. And I know my fellow literary criticism nerds out there will think a group of protagonists, ugh. <laughs> but English majors aside, uh, that's really how you have to view your D and D game and understand that if somebody decides to not adhere to your advice or to go a different path, it's not that they don't think that your advice is valuable or they don't think that you as a player aren't valuable. It's just they they decided to make a different call, especially in those big group discussions where you offer an idea for a course of action and then the group collectively decides to go another direction. That one, I mean, if it's put to a vote, it's put to a vote. And just because people didn't vote for your option doesn't mean that your option was bad. It's just they wanted to try a different one for a multitude of options. Oftentimes, I will vote for an option that I think is one of the worst ones because I think it's more interesting from a storytelling standpoint. Or my character would vote that way, even though I as the player know this is a terrible idea and this idea over here is much better and more logical. But my character wouldn't think that. My character would think, no, I want to fight them head on. No, I want to sneak in. Whatever the bad idea is, my character might vote for that one because it makes sense for their character to vote that way. So just because the other players around the table aren't heeding your advice doesn't mean that your advice is bad. It just may not line up with how they feel like their character would act in that moment. So take a step back when you're feeling ignored in that instance and think about why. And if it hits a point where you are really feeling like you are consistently being ignored at the table, then it doesn't hurt to bring it up. It doesn't hurt to have that conversation. But I assure you that feeling ignored just because people aren't taking your advice all the time is, it's a natural thing, but it's something to work on. And it's something to acknowledge that you aren't the only person at the table, your ideas aren't the only ones being presented, and perhaps you need to take a step back and think about how you're A, presenting the ideas and why your ideas aren't being taken. Now, this next one isn't directed at other players so much as directed at the DM. And it's acting constantly disappointed when you don't get the cool loot on the adventures. 
part of this game is getting cool things. And as both a dungeon master and a player, I recognize and understand that. It is awesome when you get a cool new magic item. One of my favorite things to do when a new book comes out, like Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, is to look at the new magic items because they're really cool. But as a player expecting to get a new cool piece of loot every adventure, every time you open a chest, there being something there for your character is a bit unrealistic, being perfectly honest. Because as a dungeon master, I'm not going to load every treasure chest with a piece of cool gear for every single player. I'm going to have a few things and then one cool thing for one player. And then a couple sessions later when they open another chest, a few neat things, and then one cool thing for another player. And so those items are spread out over a long duration of time. And if you as the player are getting frustrated or constantly acting disappointed that you're not getting the cool loot, you're gonna create some friction at the table with both the dungeon master and your fellow players because, well, you're not celebrating the fact that they're getting cool stuff. You're not celebrating the fact that your ranger just got an awesome new bow because you wanted a new shield. And ugh, okay, well, hopefully the next chest I'll get something cool. Just, I this one is tough for me because it it's a specific type of player I feel like that will have this uh, overt reaction. A lot of people, myself included, have had those internal reactions where it's like, okay, well, maybe, maybe I'll get the cool thing that I want next time. And even that can go noticed at the table. And your dungeon master may be inclined to give you something just to tide you over, just to get you to be quiet if you're being that overt about it. But you can't overload a campaign with too many magic items. It, it'll break the campaign. If you are a player who has never DM'd before, trust me, it, it can get bad if you give too many big magic items out too quickly or too frequently. And so understand that there is a balance to this and that cool magic items aren't gonna be around every corner and that you all are gonna have to work for them and find them and search for them. And just take a step back and celebrate when anybody at the table gets a cool magic item. Once again, it's about this, this mind frame of the party as the protagonist. Just because your character didn't get a cool thing, your collective got a cool thing. Your collective got better, got more effective. And so, and if you're celebrating other players getting their magic items and getting cool loot, when it comes time for your character to get some cool loot. They will be there celebrating alongside you. They won't be disappointed that they didn't get the cool thing because you haven't been disappointed that you aren't getting the cool thing. So just take a step back and celebrate the fact that your collective party is getting better, is getting more powerful, has found this cool thing that will make you all better and have more fun at the table. A lot of magic items aren't about making the party more powerful, but just making the story more interesting. And so be engaged in that, be excited about that. When when somebody finds something that is mysterious or intriguing, or you're gonna have to like go get it identified, be engaged in that because the DM probably spent some time coming up with a cool side story surrounding this item. And if all you're gonna do is be disappointed that it wasn't for you, that's gonna suck <laughs> for not only the DM, but the player who the magic item is for. So take a moment, take a breath, acknowledge that everybody is there to have a good time and tell a compelling story and just wait for your time to come. It will come. You will get cool magic items unless your DM is running a low level magic item uh, type game, in which case they should have told you about that in session zero. If they didn't, then that's gonna be a bummer and you're gonna be waiting a while, but yeah, just take a moment, take a breath, and enjoy the game. And before we move on, if you are enjoying this video and finding it all helpful, please like it, subscribe to the channel, it would help so much. And if you wanna to talk to me about this stuff in real time or D&D in general, head on over to our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash thegeekpantheon. I Twitch every Sunday and Tuesday at 8 p.m. Central and Saturdays at 7 a.m. Come hang out, I would love to have you. This third one, I feel like, is gonna be one of the more contentious ones that I say because I've seen it happen at so many tables and I've done it and I've had it done to me and I've been DMing games where one player does it to another player. And that is denying other characters their moments because of the story. And what I mean is if the party is leaving on some big quest and they're having to run out of town to go do the thing and stop the big bad evil and yada, 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 
And one of the player characters is having a moment with their parents, with their apprentice, with their love interest, and having a heartfelt goodbye. They're having a good character moment. Don't be the character that's running up and be like, oh, we don't have time for this. We need to go. We need to go. Just no, 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 no. We need to go. And ruining that moment for the player and the character because that's not okay. Yes, you all do have a timetable. And yes, you all are in a crunch and logically everybody should be sprinting their way out of town, but that's not how stories are told. That's never how stories are told. The dramatic moments are there in spite of the timetable, in spite of the stakes, but no good author is cutting those moments out of their story. And so if the job of the party and the DM is to collectively tell a really compelling story, then don't cut out the interesting character-driven dramatic moments. Let them happen. Let them have time to breathe. There is a difference, mind you, between you as a player saying to another player, we don't have time for this, we need to go, and your character shouting from down the road after like a few minutes of this heartfelt goodbye, we need to go, we're running out of time, and then letting it be. Because that can add some tension to the character-driven scene, and that's fine if you do it once. And then maybe once you know that the scene is dying down, you can give another shout. But what I'm talking about is when player to player is saying, we don't have time for this, we don't have time to do this, because that's very deflating, because I don't know about you all, when when I get to play a character, which I'm getting to right now, and I'm very excited about it um, in, in our new actual play series, Kyber Shards, I live for those moments. I live for the cool, character-driven, dramatic moments that I can really pour myself into and, and feel for my character and the NPC that I'm having this scene with and with the dungeon master who I'm getting to have this scene with. And those are my favorite moments in any campaign. Not the critical t <laughs> hits, not the uh, the death blows, not any of that stuff. The character moments are what I'm really excited for. And I've had moments like that taken from me by other players who have said, oh, we, we have to go. It doesn't make sense for us to stop and have this conversation. We need to go. And I say, okay, that's fine. And I move on with the game. And I know that that would have been a really cool scene. And that would have made the session for me. And the DM probably would have had a really good time playing out that moment too, but the other players don't want to wait. So let's go. So yeah, this one, I just, I, th this is clearly one that's very personal for me because I've also done it. I've been that person and don't do it. Don't, don't do it. Most DMs out there, 90% of DMs, 95% of DMs aren't going to punish the party for good role play if that makes sense. There's a diff because you're not getting a mechanical benefit from it. If you're staying behind to try and get more information or save more people or something like that, and it becomes this, uh, this choice of do you continue on to stop the fight or do you stay behind to prevent collateral damage? That's a different thing, but just a very intimate, heartfelt goodbye. I'll miss you because my character thinks that they're not going to make it back. Most of the DMs I know aren't going to punish the party for a player getting to have a moment like that. So don't be so worried about it. And if if I were a DM running a campaign where a scene like this was happening and I wanted to add that element of stakes, I'm going to let, I'll, I'll let the player know. I'll let the player know this conversation has been going on a while. Like, uh, are, you, are you sure you want to keep talking? It's not your job as a fellow player to let let that player know. Like, once again, Character to character, totally different thing. But player to player, uh, not to put it too bluntly, it's not your job. It's not your job to dictate the timeline. That's the DM's job. And if the DM's not clearly communicating that, then they need to work on that. But you don't need to cut a fellow player's moment short just because A, you legitimately think that logically the timetable is too short, or B, you're bored. Because I've seen, I've seen other players do it for both reasons. I've seen other players who are clearly not interested in the role-playing part of the game get bored and say, can we, can we just move on? Can we go? Let's go. Uh, which is even worse. So um, just because 
your part of the game that you find engaging isn't happening in that moment. Don't take it away from another player. A lot of times I find combat kind of boring, but you don't see me <laughs> going, can we just move on? Like this combat is boring. I don't want to do it anymore. Can we go on to something else? Because I'm there for the role-playing aspect of the game, but I don't try to cut it short because other people really enjoy it. So let other play characters and players have their moments, give those moments time to breathe. And if you're a dungeon master, if you want to have stakes attached to the fact that they're staying behind to talk to this person, clearly communicate that because these moments need to be allowed to happen. In my opinion, in my games, the games that I both run and I play in, I like to have these moments. Number four is a pretty simple, straightforward one of a bad player habit that I think most DMs out there will jump out of their chairs and agree with me on not taking notes slash reading the notes taken by another player because not everybody's a note taker. I'm not a great note taker. I'll take important things and jot them down, but I'm not the person that's gonna chronicle the whole campaign and write down every NPC's name and every location so that I can then like call back and be like, oh yes, I, I know this. I, I'm not that type of player, but I play in games with other players who are and love that and love chronicling the whole campaign. And the bare minimum that I can do as a player that doesn't take notes is read the notes taken by another player. Just give them a once over, read them, not study them, just read them. There are so many options out there from OneNote to Evernote to uh, Google Docs to where you can share a document or in the case of OneNote, a literal notebook for your note taker to put their notes in and share with the entire group. And then everybody else can read them. But you need to read them if you're not going to take notes because there's nothing more deflating than as a dungeon master, having a really cool callback moment, having a, an NPC that was like middling and not really insignificant, significant coming back to be a more influential part of the campaign after five, six, seven sessions. But if most of your table doesn't remember that NPC, boy, it's a really deflating moment. It's heartbreaking. <laughs> I can tell you when everybody's like, oh, oh, okay, that guy. Okay. Instead of, oh, they came back. Oh my gosh. And yeah, so read the notes. <laughs> Keep up with the, the NPCs that have been in your game. And and that's just common courtesy because part of the joy of D&D, &D, part of the joy of a campaign and why so many tables that I know of when they're moving on to their next campaign want that campaign to be a continuation of the first campaign is because when we play D&D, &D, when we play any tabletop role-playing game, we are getting to create our own personal lore. We're getting to create our own personal stories with rich worlds and rich fiction and rich characters surrounding them. And in order for that to be significant, in order for that to be meaningful, you have to know what the lore is. You, you have to know who the players are and the, the players in the world, not the players at the table. Hopefully you know who they are, but you, you need to be invested somewhat. You need to be engaged with the story and the world and the lore. And if you're not going to be, then that's, that's going to hurt the table as a whole. So take notes. I, I would encourage everybody to take some form of notes, especially stories related to your character. If it's an important moment for your character, if it's an important NPC for your character, you should be taking notes. Whether it's on the back of your character sheet or on a napkin or <laughs> whatever, you should be the one logging that because it's your character. But if you're not gonna do that, at the very least, Honor the work being done by another player at your table and read their notes so you can keep up on what's happening in the game. Because a lot of games, like my game, plays monthly. So I have four weeks between sessions. I'm not going to remember 50% of what happened a month later. So notes are very helpful in that regard. I think I may have lied with number three in saying that that, that was going to be the most controversial one that I said. Uh, because number five is definitely going to be the most controversial one. Um, don't let your character's inflexibility ruin the fun for others. If you're playing a lawful good paladin, if you're playing a chaotic neutral rogue, if you're playing any alignment that you have on your character sheet, or you didn't do an alignment, but wrote a very clear 
personality and backstory for your character with clear lines that they are unwilling to cross, that's fine. That's totally normal. In fact, most people in the world have lines that they are unwilling to cross, no matter what. However, once again, your character is not the protagonist. The collective of the party is the protagonist. And if your character is going to constantly and consistently deny progress in the story, then from a, a literary standpoint, you are no longer the protagonist. In fact, you are the antagonist because you are preventing the story from progressing, which is the role of the antagonist to do. So yeah, you, you kind of are being the bad guy if you're preventing the story from progressing. So it, I'm, I'm kidding, of course, your character is not the bad guy, but you need to acknowledge the fact that when you're making this backstory, when you're making this character and you're having these lines that you're unwilling to cross, uh, those of you that have already started watching the Kyber Shards content that we put out will know that uh, Ari has some very hard opinions. My character Ari has some very hard opinions about members of the Dragon Marked House, and he does not want to truck with them. He does not want to deal with them. He is not friendly towards any of them. So what happens sometime during the campaign when our party is presented with an opportunity to work with a member of a Dragon Marked House for a job that we need to do? that we have to accomplish. And Ari is unwilling to work with this person, to meet with this person, to exchange words with this person because he has this line of, no, I will not work for them. In fact, I kind of want to see them all like taken out of power or dead. How do I grapple with that? Well, first off, as a player, I need to think about that now instead of in the moment when it's happening and think about, okay, what circumstances, what situations would Ari be willing to bend on this? And what would my fellow characters in the party need to say to Ari to get him to bend to this? And think those things through, because it's going to come up, probably. If you've told your DM this, they're probably going to bring it up at some point. But there are a few different ways that you can deal with it. In the moment, if it's something you haven't thought about, you're like, oh my gosh, like my character would never do this. My character would never be okay with this. So the first one is to allow for your character to be convinced in some fashion through role play. Uh, once again, this goes back to thinking things through before it comes up in the moment, but thinking through what arguments could be made. So for Ari, if, if it's the idea that like working with this one person is going to lead to greater gains down the road for his, his quest to, uh, against the dragon marked houses, then maybe he might be okay with it. He might be willing to compromise and be like, fine, I'm going to, I'm not going to be friendly to him, but I'll, I'll work with them towards this bigger end goal. So maybe if a player makes, or a, char a character makes that argument to Ari, he might be willing to relent. So that's one way to do it, is, is think of the in-fiction reasoning and logic that would get your character to bend on, on this principle that they have. The second option is to not have your character do it. Just say no. And then allow the DM to give you a NPC or another character to play that session, for, to play for the duration of that quest. Your character is not going to go. But presumably you want to keep playing D and D. So yeah, give me a temporary character. I will play them. I will control this NPC. Perfect example. If we're talking about the, the Ari thing for Kyber shards, if I decide Ari is unwilling to go, then I'll control the dragon mark person on that mission that they're working with. Uh, and, and I'll, I'll run them at the table and role play for them and, and things like that. And yeah, that's, that's what you can do in that instance. The last option uh, which I know a lot of you out there are going to disagree with, but feel free to let me know down in the comments below. Roll for it. Roll for it. This game is built on rolling dice. So if one character wants to do something, another character doesn't want to, and there's no clear path to, to just figuring out through role play, then have, have the character trying to do the convincing to your character, 
role against a DC set by the DM, probably, uh, since they're a, as close as you're going to get to a uh, unbiased third party. In that scenario, you can't set the DC because you'd be like, 25 is what it would take to convince me to do this. It's like, no, no, it, it's not that high. So, yeah, r because I know that a lot of DMs and a lot of players out there balk at the idea of any form of PvP any form of players rolling against other players. But this speaks to something that I, I feel like a lot of players need to acknowledge, and a lot of DMs need to acknowledge also at their tables. You are not your character. Y you're not. You, you are controlling a fictional being that you have created in a fictional world, and that, that's great. But you are not at all times in control of every facet of your character because the DM can roll dice and hit you. You don't get a say in that. It's just, I rolled the dice. You are hit. You can be made fearful. You can be frightened, even though you may have written the most cool character ever that's not scared of anything. Well, guess what? If they fail that saving throw, they're frightened and they're scared. <laughs> like, <laughs> they, they, are, they are scared. And so we, we accept those things in, in structured encounters, in combat, as being, well, yeah, I'm not in control of everything in the world. So, yeah, stuff can happen to my character to make them do things that I don't think they would do. Well, that should be true in all parts of the game, in my opinion. Every table is different. This is just how I, I run my table and how I think the game should be played personally. But if just like when you roll against one of my NPCs as a DM, I don't have to, I, I created that NPC. They are my creation in this fictional world. And I know their thoughts and feelings just as much as you know your characters. But if you roll a persuasion check and you roll high enough, well, they're going to do something against their best interests or they might do something that they never thought they would be willing to do because you rolled well. And if the chaotic neutral rogue in the party rolls a check to convince the lawful good paladin in the party that doing this heist and getting this big load of money that they could get to do all this good in the world and the bank is corrupt and it's going to just be in the pockets of bad people, yada, yada, yada. So breaking the law this one time is actually the lawful act because criminals have the money. Then if the rogue rolls high enough, the paladin sees the logic. They pass the check, the adventure can move on. And then if they don't pass the check, then we can talk about a temporary character or maybe they don't do the thing. Maybe that's the point. Like as a DM, if you're calling for a check in this moment, you're kind of acknowledging that this role is going to determine whether or not the party does the thing or not. Uh, and so that's the final way that you can resolve this kind of thing is rolling for it, which I know a lot of people are not going to be in favor of, but that's just my opinion on how I think you could resolve a situation like this. And that is it. The five worst player habits I have ever had and how I think they should be dealt with at the table. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to give it a like. Subscribe to the channel. We'll have plenty more videos like this coming out soon. Let me know what you thought and what bad habits have you developed as a player over the years. Let me know down in the comments down below. Thank you all so much, and I will see you next time.